While experimentation is the major tool inside of our researcher toolbox, there are other types of research that's commonly used that doesn't involve experiments. Non-experimental research is research that lacks the manipulation of an independent variable. Instead, you essentially measure factors as they naturally progress or occur. This distinction between experimental and non-experimental is pretty important. Experiments provide evidence for changes in a DV caused by an IV independent variable, and non-experimental approaches can't make that claim. But this in no way means that non-experimental strategies are any less important. We use non-experimental strategies when it's inappropriate, not feasible, not possible, or not ethical to manipulate an independent uh, variable. This is preferred in cases where your research question relates to one variable instead of two or more, or when your question pertains to a non-causal relationship. An example of this would be the correlation between verbal intelligence and mathematical intelligence. They are correlated, but you can't manipulate someone's intelligence, it just kind of is what it is. And you use non-experimental research when you can't randomly assign participants to conditions. Say you want to look at what happens when someone has brain damage to their prefrontal cortex. Here you have to find people that already have damage to their prefrontal cortex. You don't have the power, thankfully, to decide which people will get brain damage. There are different types of non-experimental research, and we'll touch on three here. Non-experimental research is described in more depth in the book, so I encourage you to read through that as well. The first type is cross-sectional research. This is where you compare two or more groups that already meet a certain criteria. You don't randomly assign people and you don't manipulate anything. Um, these are just quasi-experimental variables. You gather 50 males and 50 females and you test them on something. Or you find 50 people who have damage to their hippocampus in their brain, or you gather 50 people with no brain damage. The other two types are observational research and correlational research, and we'll go a little more in depth about those two. Observational research is where behaviors are systematically observed and recorded. The goal here is to describe a variable or a set of variables as they naturally occur. Naturalistic observations specifically, um, they're when you observe behaviors in the environment that they naturally occur. The famous example here is Jane Goodall's research on chimpanzees. Dr. Goodall spent three decades just observing chimps in their natural environment in Africa. From that, we've learned a ton about chimpanzees' social structures, uh, mating patterns, and family structures, all how they occur in the wild. There are two types of naturalistic observation that we can distinguish, disguised and undisguised. In disguised observation, the subjects are unaware that they're being observed, and in undisguised observation, subjects are made aware of the researcher's presence and their monitoring of their behavior. In participant observation, researchers actively engage with participants in a group or situation. In disguised participant observation, the subjects don't know that the person they are engaging with is the researcher. In undisguised participant observation, subjects are made aware that the person they are engaging with is researching and monitoring them. In structured observations, you make careful observations of behavior in settings that are just a little more controlled than with naturalistic observations. This gives you just a little more control over what you're studying, like bringing people into a lab setting and then observing them from there. Okay, case studies can be a powerful tool and is an in-depth examination of a single person. This is often the case when those individuals have a really rare or unusual disorder or condition something that you just can't study in group settings because there aren't enough people with that certain condition or disorder. A famous example of a case study is the case of HM. HM had severe epileptic seizures and didn't respond to typical types of medications. As a last ditch effort, neurosurgeons went in and resected bilaterally parts of the medial temporal lobe. Turns out that the medial temporal lobe includes what's known as the hippocampus which we now know is critical for consolidating new information into long-term memory. The picture on the right shows two scans. The one on the left shows HM's MRI scan, and on the right is a healthy control subject for comparison. In those red circles is where the hippocampus lives, 
And you can see on HM scan on the left, it's just pretty dark. It's dark because there's no signal coming from that area because that part of the brain was removed. So after surgery, HM was completely normal except for the fact that he now had what's known as anterior grade amnesia. He could carry on conversations and remember things from his past, but he couldn't form any new memories. So in a matter of minutes, he would forget the name of the person he was talking to or forget what he was doing just a minute ago. This is a, an extremely rare case that we really can't study at the group level. And so we use this as an example to show how rare and powerful some of these case studies can be. Okay, the last big area we'll talk about is correlational research. This focuses on the statistical relationship between two different variables. Here, there's no change in an independent variable. You just passively measure two different quantitative variables. For instance, we could go to a classroom and pass out a survey and have students answer two questions. How many hours did you study for your last test? And how well did you do on that last test? We would figure that the number of hours spent studying correlates with test performance. When we use correlational research, um, we normally show the relationship between two variables using a scatter plot. A scatter plot shows the position of one individual on both variables. So this person in the red circle is one data point, and in this case, this person's total bill at a restaurant, shown on the x-axis, was something around $47. And that same person tipped their waiter, shown on the y-axis, somewhere around $9. And we can see here that there's a relationship between the total amount of a bill and the tipping amount that's left. Scatter plots are a good way to easily see what type of relationship there is between two variables. A positive relationship is shown on the top left here. This means that increases in one variable are related to increases in the second variable. Values here in a strongly correlated positive relationship hug tightly around the diagonal and move upward from the bottom left to the top right. A negative relationship shown in the top right figure is pretty much the opposite. Here, increases in one variable are related to decreases in the second variable. This is shown by values starting high in the top left and moving down towards the bottom right. And finally, if there's no relationship between the variables, the dots in the scatter plot should look like a big blob and there shouldn't really be any discernible pattern at all. You assess the strength of the relationship by using a Pearson's correlation coefficient. This value ranges from negative one to positive one. Negative one means that there's a perfect negative correlation. Positive one means there's a perfect positive correlation and a value close to zero indicates no, uh, no correlation at all. When you compare correlations, you take the absolute value of that correlation coefficient. So no matter what the sign is, the larger number indicates a stronger relationship. So a correlation of negative 0.87 is stronger than a correlation of positive 0.67. It's just that the direction is different. I'm sure you all heard this before, but we should repeat this point 100 times. Correlation does not imply causation. And this is because of two reasons. The first is a directionality problem. From a correlation, it's impossible to know the direction of the effect. Does A cause B or does B cause A? Without an experiment, you can't really say. There's also the third variable problem. Two variables could be related not because A causes B or B causes A, but because an entirely different variable causes both A and B. A good example of this is the fact that ice cream sales is correlated with murder rates, and this is actually true. So the more ice cream that is sold across the world, the more murders there happens to be. But this doesn't mean that ice cream sales cause murder rates to go up. I mean, that's pretty absurd. So I want you guys to pause the video really quickly and without Googling it, see if you can think of another variable, a third variable that could explain this correlation. So it actually has to do with temperature. Temperature is related to both of these. In warmer weather, more ice cream is being sold. And in hot weather, people are more likely to commit murder. So both of these things move together, creating this artificial relationship between ice cream and murder. And there are a lot of these spurious correlations out there. 
Uh, this site here goes over a few funny examples of spurious correlations. For instance, there is a correlation between the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool and the number of films Nicolas Cage was in that particular year. There is a correlation between the per capita cheese consumption and the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bedsheets. And the number of letters in the winning word of the script's national spelling bee correlates with the number of people killed by venomous spiders. The point here is that you can find a lot of these different types of relationships, and even a lot of media outlets will pick these up and frame, this, uh, frame these as cause and effect relationships. But without proper experimental manipulation, you can't establish that. Okay, so a lot of research involves measuring not just two variables, but a bunch of them both categorical and quantitative. Complex correlations assesses the relationships between them. So you measure a bunch of variables and you create a correlation matrix to look at all of them. Here's an example of what a correlation matrix would look like. Say you measure the scores uh, from students on algebra, biology, calculus, chemistry, geology, and statistics tests. You can calculate correlations between each pair of those variables and arrange them in a table. The diagonal here, um, they're all ones because anything correlated with itself is automatically one because they're the same exact values. Then, for instance, the correlation between algebra and chemistry is really tiny, 0.08, but the correlation between algebra and statistics is much higher, 0.41. Um, when researchers look at a large number of similar variables, they often use a technique called a factor analysis. A factor analysis is a way to organize variables into a smaller set or cluster of variables. Within each cluster, variables are organized in such a way that the variables inside of a cluster are all highly correlated and variables across different clusters all have low correlations. These different clusters or factors are interpreted as belonging to the same underlying construct. So algebra and statistics might fit under the factor of math, and biology and chemistry might cluster together under a science factor. For instance, uh, the big five personality factors have been derived by using factor analyses. Through larger scales of specific traits, um, certain scales or questions would all highly correlate within one of these five factors, either openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, or neuroticism. While it's true that correlation does not imply causation, you can, in a way, use complex correlations to rule out other possible interpretations. With partial correlations, you can look at the relationship between variables while statistically controlling for another variable. A good example is looking at the relationship between watching violent TV and the amount of aggressive behaviors from a kid. Researchers who study this are often concerned with the role that socioeconomic status plays and whether economically challenged children just happen to watch more violent TV and are also more aggressive. So here you can first examine the correlation between violent TV and aggression. Hypothetically, let's say we get a correlation of 0.35. Then we calculate the partial correlation, and we won't really talk much about the actual calculation here, uh, but you calculate the partial correlation between violent TV and aggression, this time controlling for the child's socioeconomic status. Now we get a correlation of 0.33. Since the correlations are pretty much the same, we can say that the relationship between violent TV and aggression is for the most part largely independent of someone's socioeconomic status. If, however, we saw the correlation drop to like 0.03, um, then that would suggest that SES is the third variable that is really driving that relationship. So we can use other variables within the context of this type of research to control for other variables. Once you establish the relationship between two variables, you can use this to make predictions. This is the idea behind regression. Given one value, you can guess what the value on another variable would be. The variable that is used to make the prediction is often uh, referred to as the predictor variable, and the variable that is being predicted is the outcome or criterion variable. Knowing that there's a relationship between IQ and GPA, for example, we can take a new person who hasn't been previously measured and take his or her IQ score and predict what his or her GPA would be. 
While we can make predictions using uh, regression here, we still need to be careful not to make any causal claims. So we again won't get bogged down too much about the stats at this point, um, but with regressions, you get out a slope coefficient, um, and that's used to actually calculate the predictions. For now, I just want you to know how to interpret a slope coefficient. Uh, this is a fake number, but say the slope coefficient between IQ as our predictor variable and GPA as our outcome variable um, is 0.24. That would mean that for every one increase in IQ, that's associated with a 0.2 increase in GPA. In future videos, we'll go over how to calculate things um, like regression coefficients and partial correlations um, but for now, this is a good kind of overview of non-experimental research strategies, and we'll see you next time.